The other day I came across this article about JavaScript one-liners to use in every project on Free Code Camp. Free Code Camp is awesome, by the way. And as I was going through it, I started to wonder, are these one-liners we should actually use in our projects? A couple of things that come to mind are readability, usability, do we actually need this, et cetera. So I'm gonna go through each one of these 10 and give my personal take on whether or not I would use these in my project. Now you have a link to this article in the description below, so you should read the full thing. But as we go through each of these, what we're gonna do is keep track of a yes or no for each one. And I'm gonna represent this in the bottom of the screen using binary. So one is gonna be yes, zero is going to be no. What I want you to do is follow along and give me your answers by commenting your binary string in the bottom below. All right, let's get started. So as we go through this, one additional appreciation for the author of this, Reed Barger, and Free Code Camp as a platform. But let's start with how to capitalize text. Now, I think one of the interesting questions about this is why is this not a function that does exist with JavaScript strings? And uh, they call this out by talking about this first. This is not a built-in feature, but it's something that we use almost all the time. And so the way we do this is to capitalize a string, you take the first letter, you grab it individually, you uppercase it, and then you take the rest of the string and you can catenate those two things together. Now it would be nice again if there was a two capitalized function like there is uppercase. The problem with uppercase is it makes the entire thing uppercase, but we only want the first letter. So would I use this? I think this is actually a perfect example of a one-liner. This is something that uh, is kind of a, you know, write it once and throw it away code. You're not gonna have to come back and revisit this you're probably not gonna have to change your implementation of this. It's probably just good to go and it will be in some utility file somewhere in your project and it will sit there and never have to change. And obviously this is a pretty uh, easy one to use. It fixes or it fills a void of a, of a function that honestly you would expect to be built in JavaScript, but it's not. So this one gets a one for me. All right, then we'll scroll down to, I think another really useful one and this is calculating percent. Uh, now this one is a little bit interesting because there's a little bit of caveat maybe on how you actually calculate percents. And I'm curious which way you would do this. You can let me know in the comments below. So percent is something we've done in math class for a long time where we take the, in this case, they're referring to uh, the value and the total. And we basically want to divide value from total, which in this case uh, will give us a decimal starting with uh, the decimal. So it'll be decimal and then something, something, something. To get that to a readable percent, we multiply that to times 100. And in this case, they're calling math.round on that final result. Now, math.round could, uh, based on uh, where the decimal falls, could round up or down, but maybe there's different implementations of this where you specifically want to round down or specifically want to round up on some calculations. I don't know, but I could see there being a little bit of ambiguity in there. So I could see this being a function that you go back and potentially update. But this one is relatively straightforward for me. Again, it's another one you throw in a utility file. It probably just sits there, probably doesn't get changed. So this one gets a one for me. All right, let's scroll down to an interesting one here, which is to get a random element. Now this is something I've written in a lot of different code. And I actually like to separate this into separate values. So when we call math.random and multiply that times item.length, we're trying to get a number between zero and the length of the array, a random number. And then we take that and we floor it. So we wanna make sure that we can't get the actual length of the array, because if we have five elements and we, get, we wanna access at index five, that's not how it works with arrays because arrays are zero based indexing. So the max we can go to is four. So that's why we floor this. And then we use this random number as the index to get the item out of the items array. Now for me, I actually really like, since these are kind of multiple different calculations and once, I would probably break this out into my own function. I like having the variable set for random index as its own individual thing. And as far as readability goes, I think this is starting to get a little bit tricky. Again, if it's something you're not looking at ever and you don't need to change the implementation of, it's probably fine. But my personal opinion, just for readability and usability for myself, I would break this out into uh, at least a couple of lines because they don't really take up that much space to set a separate variable for the random index and then go ahead and return the item at that index. So this one gets a zero. I would not use this one personally in my project. All right, let's go down to number four, which is a really interesting one of how to remove duplicate elements. Now the example here, I think if you're, if you're building a function that is a one liner, then this is the perfect solution to this. 
So the problem with arrays or a problem with arrays is if you have an array of elements and you want to get rid of the duplicates, you'd have to do a bunch of manual logic to go and uh, basically keep like a, a key value pair reference to how many counts the thing has and not move something over if it's already been um, been tracked in your map, et cetera, et cetera. But in JavaScript, they have sets. Now sets automatically do dedupe for you. That's kind of the shorthand for remove duplicates. So when you put an array into a set, a set will automatically go and take out the duplicate. So it does the hard work for you. And then what this is doing is it's putting the array into a new set and then it's spreading that set back into an array. So you're converting it to a set to get rid of duplicates. Then you're converting it back to an array to have the final array there. Now, my question here is this is something I've done a lot, but I've never felt the need to have a function called remove duplicates for this. I consider this to be a, a fairly standard thing for this. Like this is exactly what sets are intended for. So my personal opinion is I would not have a separate function for this. I would just continue to treat this like a one liner. And this is potentially an argument for the previous ones. If it's code that never changes and it's one liner, is it worth having a separate function for? And if you look at this syntax, you're actually doing probably more code than if you were to just assign this back to a new variable directly. So in my personal opinion, this one would get a zero for me. I would not use this one only because I would use this part here as a one liner directly instead of calling or creating and calling a function called remove duplicates. So this one starts to get kind of interesting how to sort elements by a certain property. This is using the array.sort function and this starts to get kind of ugly. Now I do wanna say if this is again the kind of thing where you create it once and you set it off somewhere and you never have to update, totally fine, I get the use case here. But this is starting to get really tricky to look at. So what we have is we have our comparator function and it takes in two parameters, A and B, one element and the next element. And then we're doing comparisons on here based on a key. So we wanna compare by a certain property. Now in this case it says, if the value associated with the key in A is greater than the value associated with that same key in B, then we return one. And then we have the or, and then we do another ternary. Anytime we get into nested or double ternaries, I think that's automatically kind of a hard pass for me. The readability of that I think gets exponentially more difficult the more we add. And this seems really, really tricky to read. Now, another interesting thing is by comparing, by sorting elements by certain properties, you can't necessarily, you won't necessarily always have that come down to strict math as in using the greater than or the less than sign. So there are certain instances where you may need to do some other type of calculation based on that property, which would kind of render this function uh, null and void in those use cases. So I think this probably comes down to more of a case by case basis for me. And then if you see yourself for me, if I see myself trying to do a nested ternary operator, that would be a hard no for me. So for this one, I give a zero. Now, really quick, if you enjoy what we're talking about and you want to stay up to date with the JavaScript content that I create, I have a newsletter that you can check out at jamesqquick.com slash newsletter, where I send out weekly updates on content that I find interesting, stuff that I'm working on, topics in web development and JavaScript, et cetera. So go and check that out at jamesqquick.com slash newsletter. Now, this one is really interesting. How to check if arrays and objects are equal. Now, this is a problem or this is a challenge because of the way JavaScript objects are compared. So when you do the triple equals and you compare two objects in JavaScript and arrays are objects, when you do those two comparisons, what you're actually, actually doing is comparing the pointers that point to the objects themselves. So if you create a variable const array one equals and then an array, and then you create a new variable const array two, set it to array one, those are basically pointers that are pointing to the same space in memory to the same exact object. So you're not specifically comparing the values inside of the array, you're comparing the pointer to point to the exact same object. So if you have one array that's ABC and then another array that also is created as a new separate array as ABC, those will not be triple equals because they're different pointers. Now this is an interesting kind of fun topic in programming and can be challenging for people. So the way that people have gotten around this in certain cases is to stringify each of the different arrays or objects into a JSON string and then compare those JSON strings. This is kind of a hack. This gets used 
uh, in different places. I think there are some small exceptions where this doesn't work or that maybe it's only if you're parsing it back into a JSON object, I can't remember. But I think I would probably shy away from a JSON stringify comparison. It is a hack, you can do it. I would probably go through each element and write a double for loop or a single for loop that iterates both at the same time and then compares those individual items uh, directly. Now that can get really tricky when you get into nested arrays. So in that case, you may need to go for a third party library that can do a deep comparison for you. So that stuff can get tricky. This is a hack to try to solve that problem. Totally understand why it's there, but since it's a little hacky and it's not, it's not the kind of thing that I would do myself unless I just really needed to. But if I had to choose, I would not use this one in my code. So I would give this a zero. All right, so how to count number of occurrences. This is a very common pattern that I love to refer to as the accumulator pattern. And it's basically you initialize some value, you iterate through an array or an iterable of some sort, and you update that original value. So that's exactly what the reduce function is for with arrays where you start out with, here's the initial value, and then you have your function and you get the accumulator and then the current value. Now this always kind of tricks me out, trips me out. So in each, each iteration of the reduce, you get access to the accumulator, which is starting at zero, and then you augment that and return it. And then inside of here, you're doing a comparison to see specifically in this case, does the value that we're currently on equal the value that we're targeting? If so, we increment a, otherwise uh, we just return a. So this is one, I don't know that this is the kind of thing that makes sense to have as a function in terms of how often will you use it. I also personally would prefer this to be on a couple of different lines just from a readability standpoint, because you have kind of an arrow function defined here, you're calling reduce, have another arrow to function defined in here. And the reduce function in general is already tricky enough that people have challenges with it. So my personal take is I would also not do this as a single uh, line function. Uh, I question whether or not we need this as a function, like how often this comes up to be able to reuse. And then I would also just kind of separate it into to separate lines to make it a little more readable. Now, this is one that I love. I think this is a perfect example. There is no way built into JavaScript to uh, just await something kind of in line. You have access to set timeout. You can handle the callback and set timeout to be able to execute some sort of JavaScript, but you don't have a way to do it kind of in line. So I've seen this all over the place. I've thrown this exact same code into uh, my code before to add a delay to simulate testing or whatever it is. So in this case, what we do is we define our function that takes in a number of milliseconds. We create a new promise and I'm going against myself because this then has a nested arrow function, which I just talked about not doing before. But in this case, we call our set timeout. And then when that set timeout finishes, based on that number of milliseconds, we call the resolve function. And then we just go about our code. So what happens is you can then uh, use this directly in here. Actually, I would not uh, dot then this, because if you were to use your dot, then you're kind of getting rid of the benefit of having created the weight function. I guess you save yourself a little bit of time, but if you were to do it this way, you basically would just be calling uh, set timeout if that makes sense directly. So what I would do is I would use async await. So I would do await, wait, and then 2000 milliseconds. That way it's in line and you don't have to worry about additional dot thens. So I would use this one, but I would caveat the usage of this to use it with async await when you call the wait function instead of using dot then on the wait function. So this one gets a one for me. Now this is an interesting one, how to use the pluck property from, how to use the pluck property from array of objects. I've never quite seen this, I guess it makes sense, um, but pluck in here is basically saying for an array of objects, you wanna get the value of one specific uh, property out of each object and then convert that to a, uh, a, an array. And so I kind of question the reusability of this. How many times does this come up where that's exactly what you want and they're nested objects and you specifically want one property from it. I kind of, I don't see this as like a, a really reusable use case. So I would question whether or not this needs to be an actual function. If I came across this scenario, I would be totally good with writing this code and just running with that directly instead of having this be in a function because I don't see the reusability of that myself. So in this case, this would get a zero because I would just call this or use this functionality or code snippet directly instead of creating the separate function. Now, last thing is how to insert an element at a certain position. And if you're 
Like me, you always get confused by slice and splice. But the reason this person is creating this is specifically because the splice operator, which does allow you to do inserts, does mutate the original array. So if you want a solution that does not mutate the original array, you can write your own. And so you have your array, the index, and the item you want to put in. You slice out the first segment, you add in the item, and then you slice out the rest of it into a new array. I like this one, especially if you're really big in not mutating arrays, objects, etc. I think this is a good alternative to splice. It has a specific use case, and I think this makes a lot of sense. So this one gets a one for me. All right, so those are the 10 one-liners with the question being, should you use these inside of your code? I'm really curious to see what your responses are to this. So comment below with your binary string of one for yes, if you would use it, not two, zero for no, if you would not use it and comment that 10, 10 digit binary code in the description below. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like and subscribe to come back for more of this type of content in the future. And if you have more details about any of the stuff that we talked about, to be explained that you would like to see, let me know that as well. Thanks as always for checking out the video and I'll catch you next time.